Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome students to the online NPTEL course Visual Communication Design for Digital Media. In the previous lectures, we were discussing about the uh, elements and principles of design. We discussed uh, how, what are the different elements uh, with the permutation and combination of different elements, how we can design with uh, uh, after applying the different principles of design. Then we uh, also discussed about the typography, how to incorporate typography, how to design, if you want to design a new typefaces, how to design them and uh, how to blend with the uh, pictures and the photographs and what you are designing in the uh, visual communication design on digital media. And then we also discussed about what are the different uh, domains of uh, digital media available, what are the different uh, paradigms. And um, then we also, uh, this part was uh, the part of uh, design concerning um, uh, the, the process of design. Then we also move, uh, move towards the process of under, uh, interpretation from the user's perspective. Then we discussed the semiotic theories and uh, with um, the, the detailed uh, discussion of science and iconographs uh, and uh, what uh, means wo uh, what with uh, the semiotics, pragmatic, uh, uh, semantics, pragmatics and all these uh, things. And then we also discussed about the perceptions. Uh, so what is the visual perception uh, happens after you design something and how people look at it. So, uh, it is all what we were discussing, it is dependent on the user's perception as well as their sociocultural backdrop. But there is another factor which is the time and uh, design changes over time. So, time factor is also important and this is right now in this module and the next module we will uh, talk about the how design and visual language changes over time. So, we will discuss the contemporary visual language in, uh, in the um, uh, platform of design. We will not only discuss uh, just the digital um, uh, design platform because it is a uh, there is a continuum with the art and design and everything uh, fuses everything uh, is amalgamated together and uh, there is no uh, clear cut line from where the design evolved and from where art um, uh, which field is art and which field is uh, what kind of visual language is there in design. So, there is all coherent and all uh, evolved together. So, we have to discuss uh, something about, about the tangible um, uh, design media, for example, art, painting and uh, print media. But we are not discussing about the history part of it. Uh, we divide history and contemporary from the time of industrial revolution. So, pre-industrial revolution re uh, till renaissance, baroque and rococo all these things were uh, is discussed within uh, the history part of art. art. And then uh, from uh, industrial revolution, so post industrial revolution, we discuss, uh, we think, uh, we um, um, name that part as contemporary um, um, design and uh, art. So, as design, the domain design is very uh, nascent and evolving, it is more related to us uh, contemporary, it is also uh, uh, definitely related to um, uh, with the uh, history part of it, but it is more evolved with the um, evolve uh, 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 of the changes with the contemporary art and design. So, we start with the post industrial evolution contemporary part and we uh, within the contemporary part we will discuss about modernism and post modernism and after discussing post modernism we will um, uh, we'll discuss that how digital media evolved and how uh, what are the different uh, uh, visual styles in digital media. So, uh, uh, contemporary, uh, we use the term contemporary art and the art history and uh, uh, contemporary design and uh, history. So, uh, there is a, a slight difference and we uh, differentiate this era of contemporary from uh, industrial revolution. So, uh, industrial revolution you must uh, know, uh, you must have uh, known this, uh, uh, it happened in uh, mostly in Europe and uh, then it flour uh, flourished all over the world. So, industrial um, revolution happened just after, um, uh, I, I mean it is a it is a continuation of renaissance. So, renaissance after renaissance there was a lot of um, industrialization and people uh, from uh, village moved to uh, the city and a uh, lot of manufacturing, mass production and uh, technology boom happened. So, uh, before industrial re uh, revolution there was uh, uh, mostly the art and architecture was uh, central uh, um, has 
uh, perception of um, over ornamentation. So, Baroque and Rococo uh, was the style which was going on and uh, in architecture and art it was mostly the art was um, done in cathedral and uh, chapels and we can see this uh, um, movements before uh, uh, industrial revolution was got, um, uh, starting from uh, Greek architect uh, architecture, Roman architecture, then Gothic and all this um, Victorian uh, style of art and all these things. So there we can see there was a ornamentation uh, um, and uh, in uh, the last uh, art style just before uh, pre-industrial revolution was uh, Baroque Rococo was uh, the pre uh, predominant one. So there we can see a lot of ornamentation in architecture and interior design and furniture design and uh, a lot of intricacy and biomorphic uh, uh, patterns were there and a dramatic effect was crea uh, is created and in even in art so there was a term uh, called chiaroscuro so which uh, which says that there was a dramatic effect of light and shadow here we can see the Burmese uh, painting a uh, girl with a, a pearl ring here you can see there is a lot of contrast in the light and shadow so a uh, dramatic effect was and ornamentation was the uh, key characteristics of baroque and rococo so here we can see that bernini's uh, saint peter's uh, basilica room uh, saint peter's basilica room is uh, um, designed by uh, there was a contribution of many people uh, starting from Ma michelangelo to many other um, artists and architects so here bernini's um, uh, intervention in um, St. Peter's Bas Basilica, you can see a lot of ornamentation was there. These kind of ornamentations and painting we need to know because uh, this is, uh, though it is in traditional media, but these kind of ornamentation when you use in uh, digital graphics and you can, if, uh, if you use this kind of motifs in uh, digital graphics, they resemble uh, uh, this pre-industrial revolution or, or uh, Baroque and Rococo uh, time. So if you are um, creating some kind of um, ornamentation in your web page or yeah, using this kind of um, uh, patterns in uh, your um, graphic design. So that resembles to this uh, uh, era. So you need to uh, be very careful uh, while choosing and very selective while, uh, while choosing. So if you want to uh, uh, recreate that and have a sense of these era, then you can translate that. So though it is in uh, um, uh, mostly in architecture and art, uh, uh, that is how it can effect in your mood board. So if you want to uh, create this kind of uh, visual language in digital media, it will help. Also there was a uh, print media, uh, uh, existing traditional print media was there. For example, litho uh, lithography, lenography and woodcut print. So they used to uh, cut a wood block or uh, stone block or even the metal etching was uh, process was there and a uh, master uh, print uh, block will be there and you apply a color and press on top of um, on on uh, a paper or canvas and the uh, motif will be generated so here you can see the, the saturn uh, motif uh, in uh, british museum uh, curved in wood so it looks something like that so this process uh, is not only predominant uh, uh, was there in europe um, and also there in the Far Eastern Japanese and Chinese art. So you can see Japanese and Chinese woodcut print uh, which was there from uh, far before uh, the industrial evolution. And in, in industrial evolution as we were discussing in the typography um, lecture module that, uh, uh, that time Gutenberg in Germany invented the press. That time type, uh, uh, the typefaces become um, uh, I mean there was blocks of typefaces, so book printing was there. So book printing was much later but uh, printing images and uh, making this kind of uh, uh, master copies of uh, uh, the negative of the print was much uh, uh, before, uh, before um, Gutenberg invented the press. And when Gutenberg invented the press, that time the typo there was a um, uh, ab absolute paradigm shift in the typography and uh, how we perceive typography. But these kind of print medias in uh, painting and artwork and uh, traditional uh, print, print media was much before industrial revolution. And one of the in uh, the animation uh, section when we'll uh, discuss the methodology of animation, one of the animation will be discussed, uh, which was. Um, derived from the visual style of 
this uh, woodcut and linocut print so that you understand why these are important to understand and though it is in the traditional media but uh, important to understand uh, understand the visual language what was the visual language here you can see there there was a lot of uh, wooden textures and uh, a particular kind of texture will be available in the this kind of uh, printing so when you um, translate this kind of style into digital media in this kind of texture you have to use to um, relate with the visual language of um, different era. So, in 19th century industrial revolution, uh, it was the genesis of modernism. Uh, from there, a uh, uh, complete uh, change in the visual um, uh, sense and the visual language was there. And so, uh, there was a shift from agriculture to industry. There was a mass production was uh, started because um, there was um, industrial revolution, a lot of factory was made and uh, to generate the factory and uh, gen uh, to establish uh, different kind of architecture was there. So, uh, we, we, uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, influence of um, steel and glass and um, those kind of uh, high rise buildings started uh, evolving. Even in uh, design, a lot of uh, tessellation or the pattern, different kind of pattern and ma machine made um, uh, and factory made uh, things were there in the design. So, after that uh, the more modular uh, concept of modular uh, furnitures, modular design started evolving that we will discuss um, gradually. So, so uh, if we look at the timeline from where it uh, started, so uh, it is a timeline based on design and architecture and art. So, industrial evolution was a shift from there to 1950s or 1980s in terms of architecture it is a little late 1980s uh, um, and in terms of art and design it will be uh, from 1950s onwards uh, uh, till 1950s uh, to 1980s there was a modernist uh, period. So, that time there was a um, uh, you know that after industrial revolution after renaissance industrial revolution happened and after um, uh, industrial revolution there was a lot of, um, of uh, you, you know that uh, there was uh, world war and that time um, uh, and that created a lot of effect in art and design as well. After that in 1980s world became uh, more stable in terms of economy and post modern that um, uh, era uh, began. That post modern style is uh, a little different and uh, there was a lot of difference in post modern and modern, but together modern uh, and post modern uh, creates a contemporary era. So, this part from industrial evolution and uh, in the beginning of the early uh, 90s to 1950s or 1980s, this is a modernist era, this uh, part of the time frame and after that there is a post modernist era, till now we are in a post modern era and from industrial evolution total uh, this modern and post modern is contemporary, contemporary movement in art and design. So, in modern era we have different uh, isms, different uh, uh, different style evolved in modern era and from early modern there were a lot of uh, different um, contrasting style we will say because um, there are a lot of visual difference between these uh, styles. They evolved and gradually they evolved towards the late modern period and uh, which is um, uh, uh, around 1950s to 1980s and after 1980s. Uh, gradually we uh, evolved into postmoderns. So, there is no um, exact timeline from where modernist uh, movement uh, evolved into postmodern movement, but still we can say from 1950s to 1980s depending on the art uh, uh, domain, art, architecture and uh, design, uh, they, uh, they, they go parallelly, but still there is a, a change we cannot uh, uh, make a clear cut line from where modernist uh, to postmodern movement uh, started, but it is more or less uh, um, in uh, late 90s. So, in modern movement we have art novo and art and craft movement this started first. So, uh, when industrial evolution happened, so there was two kind, uh, two group of uh, two school of thought one was uh, against the machine and one was in favor of machine because a lot of uh, machine made uh, things were started generating and w uh, which was and before uh, that there was the uh, 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 we were dependent most on the uh, artisans and artist hand skill. So, we can see that just before that there was a baroque and rococo movement. So, baroque and rococo movement if we see, so this was highly ornamental. So, that was dependent on the um, craftsmanship, but after modern uh, when the uh, industrial revolution started. So, the craftsmanship and the um, 
is um, uh, dying, uh, was started to die because machine took over. So there was two school of thought, one opposed this, so against the machine movement and one was uh, accepting it, uh, which was the for the machine movement. In architecture, it's more clearly visible and also in design uh, because art, uh, uh, the Stigel movement, Bauhaus movement, they were uh, ev uh, emerged from uh, minimalist approach of design. But there were some ki uh, some uh, design movements, for, uh, for example, Art Nouveau um, and also Art Art and Craft movement and Art Deco. Uh, they were uh, they accepted the ornamentation and um, Art Nouveau was highly ornamental. And Art and Craft movement and Art Deco uh, started blending uh, the ornamentation with with the mass production and after that there was futurist, cubist, uh, sur uh, surrealist, uh, these uh, movements were there. So first talking about Art Nouveau, Art Nouveau was the in, uh, in the initial stages where there was a di uh, dilemma whether to go uh, in favor of uh, modern uh, uh, mass production or not. So Art Nouveau is highly ornamental and it, um, it um, has an, um, uh, it uh, involves, it uh, uh, combines the uh, and has uh, gives emphasis on the um, craftsman's uh, craftsmanship and artistic uh, skills of individual. So we can see Alf um, Alfonso uh, Muchas work. So here, if you look at the uh, paintings, so here a lot of biomorphic ornamental. Uh, curves were there. So, uh, if you look at this kind of ornamentations and this, uh, this kind of intricacies of uh, work, so you can see that this uh, cannot be mass produced and this has to, uh, this is highly dependent on the artistic skill and the curves and uh, the way it is um, abstraction uh, happened in the in the art form. So, it is um, uh, it's highly uh, uh, ornamental and a lot of curvilinear features were there and none of the forms were modular, none of the uh, features are repeated um, uh, and uh, most of the ornamentation you can see is has a lot of influence from Baroque and Rococo style, though definitely not uh, uh, has a lot of difference. For example, there was uh, some industrial revolutions effect on this. And uh, if you look at also architecture, you should um, also look um, look at some other uh, domains uh, in architecture. Antonio Gaudi's work and uh, Vic Victor Horta's uh, interior design and furniture design and architecture work. If you look at, they have a similar kind of uh, line quality, similar kind of uh, fluidity uh, in um, adopting biomorphic design in um, Art Nouveau style. And if you look at their um, furniture design and the facade uh, treatment of uh, Antonio Gaudi's um, um, uh, building and um, interior uh, um, ornamentations. So you can uh, see that none of these buildings were uh, is possible to create uh, by industrial uh, manufacturing. So each and every uh, facade was has to be um, uh, is an example of um, high craftsmanship. Some of the buildings were uh, in uh, Barcelona, if you look at so these uh, buildings, took a lot of time to complete. Even some of the buildings are yet to um, yet uh, not complete. So uh, that was um, Art Nouveau style. Now uh, look at the art and craft movement. So here we have William Morris uh, says uh, print, print and uh, tessellation. William Morris also designed some kind of furniture. If you look at the furniture, this fine uh, furniture has a lot of involvement of craftsmanship. But yet, you if you uh, look at uh, carefully, these kind of um, formations in uh, print media has uh, repetition. So right now we are uh, today. Um, uh, April design and textile design, we do this kind of tessellation, this is called tessellation. So one block is uh, has a mirror image and after uh, some time this similar ornamentation will be repeated on top in this side and the other side. So they create a very biomorphic, um, zoomorphic or uh, floral uh, patterns, but still they have a possibility to incorporate machine production into uh, to um, um, uh, generate a faster production. So here there are a lot of uh, influence from the uh, ornamental um, uh, stylization and ornamental um, aesthetic uh, sense, 
uh, of biomorphic uh, style and curvilinear pattern, but they are repeated so that they incorporate uh, craftsmanship and uh, industrial mass production. So they uh, take the facilities, the benef uh, benefits and the positive side of the industrial mass production for faster um, pr uh, production uh, to increase the production rate and also uh, in incorporates the uh, craftsmanships and the, their, uh, the quality of uh, the aesthetic quality and the visual language of um, the um, uh, crafts uh, um, uh, artisans and the traditional uh, form. And then uh, we have Art Deco. Art Deco is uh, different from Art Nouveau and uh, Art and Craft movement. They uh, have a more industrial uh, look. They are more, um, uh, they are less biomorphic, the curves and uh, the line qualities become more uh, towards the rectilinear but yet not completely as rectilinear as uh, the later uh, phases of art movement. Uh, for example, this Tijil or futurist or cubist uh, style. They have uh, some rectilinearity there, uh, um, uh, they are a fusion of uh, rectilinearity and curvilinearity and even there is a, com uh, um, they, they use gradient shades, gradient textures but more in a um, digital, uh, they have a digital, uh, digitally generated, uh, they, ha they have aesthetics and the look of digitally generated uh, image. So we'll uh, see some examples, but it started, uh, so this is an eclectic uh, form of art that combines handcrafted traditional motif and uh, with the machine made, uh, uh, into, um, machine -made uh, visual style. So uh, uh, from Art Nouveau, art and craft movement was more towards marrying these two uh, paradigm of uh, handcrafted and the machine made and art deco taken this to farther. Uh, one step farther and then they involved more uh, machine made uh, um, uh, and geometric uh, forms into uh, and without compromising the artistic uh, uh, sense. So uh, here some of the examples we have uh, Cassandra's uh, visuals and uh, poster designs. So if you look at the poster, so if you look at the uh, design of a train wheel, they are abstract, they are highly abstract and some of the forms without losing the detailing, they are uh, translated into more geometric shapes. So towards the more biomorphic style, we are moving towards the more uh, geometric, uh, incorporating more geometry and, and minimalizing and uh, towards more abstraction. Even the way the bird and the wine glass is conceptualized, this is broken into simpler geometry. Even if you look at the gradient, so that a gradient has a line from here, it's uh, there is a sharp change of color and also if you look at the line qualities um, he, he has used. So here this um, headgear uh, changes, uh, the, um, the, there is a sharp contrast over here. The line continues through the gradient and fades away. And here also these lines and the ears, the way it has been conceptualized, it's um, uh, uh, it's highly geometric and even if you look at this kind of uh, forms, the later movements of, uh, of De Stigil and Bauhaus also in, uh, inspired from uh, Art Deco. If you uh, remember this kind of um, form later when we will um, uh, discuss Bauhaus, uh, you will see some uh, similar kind of um, uh, abstraction of human faces. Even if you look at the um, abstraction of the shapes, so it uh, talks about the grandeur of the uh, size of the shape, but still if you can, um, if, if you see the geometry, so uh, there is a rectilinear uh, lines are appearing and uh, shape, uh, the form of the shape is broken into a simpler geometry. So the, you can perceive a rectangle here in the form of a, sh of a shape. So this rectilinear lines are there and even there is uh, a curve which blends properly with the with the rectangle. So, uh, if if you look at the gradients and the use of colors, so they have much more um, uh, defined lines here. And versus, if you look at the uh, way uh, they have used gradients in. Uh, Art, uh, art and craft movement. Art and craft movement is still more uh, has a sharp geometry, but if you look at the Art Nouveau, so here if you look at the use of gradients, so they are much more gradual and they uh, mimic the way uh, human figure um, appears. So, but here there is a sharp abstraction and ge geometric uh, abstraction is there. 
and uh, Olympica's work. So uh, Tamara de Olympica, if you see uh, the way she's um, transforming the um, uh, uh, the human figures and the draperies into uh, um, in, in, into more. Uh, geometric uh, abstraction so we can see uh, we can understand this uh, better so if you see the way uh, they are they are treating the hairs here and if you look at the way uh, it's it was there in um, Arch Nouveau style they are drastically different so here we have a lot of uh, machine made qu uh, qualities they appear uh, more like a digitally generated um, images and here also the human figures they are more they are broken into geometry they are broken into a lot of um, uh, overlapping uh, like overlapping surfaces and uh, has a metallic finish on that so that also incorporates the industrial uh, taste in uh, the taste of industrial revolution so a lot of use of uh, metal and glass was there in uh, architecture interior design and furniture design so here in uh, painting and design uh, graphic design as well though the taste of um, metals the shines of metals and uh, the geometry of the uh, era uh, geometric um, aesthetic um, the geometric visual language of the era is uh, translated in uh, and um, is imbibed in the uh, visual design and uh, graphic design as well some other examples here we can see a clear geometric uh, transformation and this is in um, this kind of uh, typeface has also evolved uh, during art deco movement so here in the typefaces also you can see a lot of geometry the typefaces are uh, broken into geometry but there are a lot of ornament uh, ornamentation in the typefaces so these uh, typefaces are highly ornamental so d could have been written just with one line and the other so that is the most late modern and minimalist uh, style of uh, writing but here um, uh, the art deco style art novo and art craft movement they have uh, highly ornamental um, and the, the, these uh, isms art movements are highly ornamental so here a lot of ornamentations are added here but still you uh, can see there are a lot of uh, uh, they are depicted in terms of geometric abstraction so there is a broadway font typefaces which is uh, 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 developed by Maurice Fuller Benton it's also uh, follows the art deco style and here we can see if you have seen the movie great uh, Gatsby that is completely the set design the uh, co costume design and everything and uh, is, is uh, based on art deco style even the, the New York Times Square that uh, the building the signages uh, if you look at the signages they are all art deco style signages even the um, uh, some of the buildings like uh, like Chrysler uh, buildings of New York uh, that's a complete uh, that's a perfect example of art deco style and uh, here this kind of um, interior work this is a, a door so this kind of uh, patterns evolved in art deco so here you can see some patterns of uh, which uh, resemble uh, which is um, of clearly art deco style so if you want to uh, translate art deco style into digital uh, platform or you want to create some visual which um, gives a connotation of um, art deco sty uh, style uh, so these kind of typography uh, you have to use and this kind of uh, form this kind of um, uh, textures this kind of patterns you should uh, provide and uh, you, you can see a lot of patterns are uh, has black and gold uh, black and metallic uh, uh, finish so that to incorporate the industrial look so metal it was uh, predominantly started uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the incorporation of metal uh, was uh, started invading in um, interior design and uh, architecture in this um, era so metal gives a look of uh, art deco movement then we come to the Des Tijel and Bauhaus movement. Uh, so from Art Deco and uh, Des Tijel Bauhaus, there is a connection. If we look uh, at the Bauhaus movements, the way they have depicted uh, the uh, figures, uh, figures of human bring, uh, human being, and uh, translated and abstract uh, uh, did the abstraction of um, uh, by, um, uh, by uh, uh, hum human figures and natures. They have a connection with Art Deco, but they are definitely more, less ornamental, more geometric, and um, their philosophy is completely different from the Art Deco um, uh, movement. So uh, you, uh, we can say the, they have the philosophy of purity of design. Purity of design they have uh, they established by the 
selection of color, selection of shapes and line qualities. So, uh, purity of design can be achieved in terms of um, uh, color selection while we uh, select only the primary colors. Uh, in primary colors in uh, while we are thinking about uh, colors not in uh, things uh, in terms of light. So, primary colors will be red, blue and yellow. If we mix red and blue we get uh, purple color in uh, color mixing theory uh, and then uh, we uh, if we mix uh, blue and yellow we get uh, green and if we mix uh, uh, red and yellow then we get orange but in terms of light it, it's um, absolutely different it's RGB and uh, the, the additive uh, combination of color is different but in Bauhaus they have uh, thought about the color mixing process so the primary colors become red uh, yellow and blue so uh, in some cases we all, uh, they have also used green in terms of as green um, uh, uh, is also a different uh, entity and RGB system is also used. So, red, green, uh, red, blue uh, uh, and yellow plus sometimes green is used and also we have neutral color palette. So, they have also used black and white. So, they are also um, uh, black is there is no light and wh white is there all light in equal proportion. So, black, white, red, green and uh, red, uh, yellow and blue these are the color selection the color, color palette of Bauhaus and the stigil uh, movement. And uh, then uh, we uh, in terms of purity of shape uh, Bauhaus is depicted by uh, rectilinear geometry pure uh, squares or rectangles, triangles and circles. So, we can see a lot of uh, use of um, circles, pure circles, uh, triangles and um, uh, rectangles and uh, squares. So, here we can uh, uh, and even if uh, in architecture if you see Bauhaus uh, designs the, the architecture Bauhaus has a strong influence in architecture and interior design and furniture design. So, Bauhaus uh, uh, on uh, the stigil furnitures if you uh, look at they have the similar shapes. So, the stigil furnitures uh, has so, uh, is combined uh, um, uh, is made out of circle triangles and rectangles and with pure colors red, uh, yellow and blue with uh, black uh, um, with addition of black and uh, white. So, Kandinsky's work uh, if we look at, so they are uh, generated from this pure geometry lot of uh, pure geometric shapes and um, rectilinear qualities we can see in the Kandinsky's wor work. And again uh, if we think about uh, the eye movement Kandinsky's work does not uh, talk about some kind of um, uh, realistic um, uh, uh, a fi a figurative uh, imagery is it is talking about it is more uh, it is talking about the eye movement. So, in, in the previous uh, lectures we uh, had discussed about the Gutenberg's theorem and how we uh, perceive uh, figures and how our eye moves. So, here we can see in the first quadrant if you remember we were discussing about the four quadrants and how our eye um, uh, is uh, first started with the first quadrant and then it gradually moves towards the last quadrant and then uh, comes uh, back. So, here we can see this composition has a, a heavy um, figure, uh, uh, figure and the focal point in the first quadrant. So, our eye uh, can uh, come here first and then we have some strong composition here in the third quad uh, second quadrant and the third quadrant, but the fourth quadrant is left uh, less intricate because as we were discussing that fourth, uh, I, our eye has a tendency to uh, go to the fourth quadrant and uh, then we can uh, go to the next um, composition. But uh, the painter does not want painters uh, uh, success uh, is dependent when you uh, grab your eye attention and uh, diverge your eye to the next some uh, other, um, um, other quadrant and so that people look at your um, uh, artwork for more time. So, if uh, the fourth quadrant is heavy then the people will look at this and the next uh, uh, their eye will be directed towards the next um, uh, uh, picture because our eye we have a tendency to look from this uh, side left to right. So, it is always our eye pulls towards the, uh, the right side and towards down. So, here we have this uh, side uh, little less intricate so that our eye again rotates and comes towards this quadrant. So, there is a composition called reverse C composition. So, our eye moves as a reverse C. It starts from first quadrant and then comes back 
uh, uh, comes to the uh, second quadrant, then fourth qu quadrant, and there is a strong pull in the th third quadrant. So our eye rotates and comes to the third quadrant, and again we go back to the first quadrant. So we spend more time within the uh, picture frame. So if you look at uh, uh, Kandinsky's work in this uh, uh, these two composition and um, uh, un understand this uh, Gutenberg's theory in this uh, composition we see uh, in the uh, if we uh, think about the four uh, different quadrants the first quadrant is heavy uh, quadrant is heavy and uh, the first um, second and third quadrant is also heavy unlike uh, 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 of the typography and the newspaper because in newspaper it is uh, all uh, it is like uh, the complete newspaper the news informations uh, are um, uh, comes as a, a complete uh, design. So here in the newspaper, the uh, initial uh, uh, according to our uh, tendency of uh, 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 reading uh, type, uh, typefaces and reading uh, compositions, we start from the uh, uh, top left and go towards the right and go towards the uh, bottom. So um, uh, the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant becomes really heavy. But in uh, terms of composition, if we make uh, the fourth quadrant really heavy, then we'll go towards the next composition. The uh, designers or the uh, painter doesn't want that because the success of the painter depends on the. Uh, attention span uh, they can uh, take uh, 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 ga grab the attention span uh, from the user so uh, here intentionally the second and third quadrant is heavy so it creates a reverse composition so from first uh, quadrant our eye starts uh, because we have a tendency to uh, start from uh, left to top and then towards the second quadrant it comes and it doesn't really stays on the fourth quadrant if it stays then we'll go towards the next uh, composition it comes back to the th third quadrant as you can see the third quadrant is heavy and it goes towards the first quadrant if uh, because uh, the strong figure ground uh, relationship and strong focal uh, point you can see in the uh, picture in the other composition uh, you can see there's a, a diagonal connection from the second to third quadrant so that second and third quadrant becomes really heavy because in uh, any way we will have our attention in the first uh, quadrant and if the first and fourth quadrant diagonal connection is more heavy we will go towards the next composition so that uh, so to oppose that the second quadrant and third quadrant composition is really heavy here in the other uh, Bauhaus and the Estigil, uh, um, composition we have the predominant colors uh, selection of uh, as we were discussing the blue red and yellow that's the primary color and um, white and black is used even you uh, see the um, uh, poster there are a lot of uh, rectilinear geometry and industrial stylization is there and this is uh, these are some Harvard Bears um, poster this is one of the famous poster which uh, depicts the Bauhaus uh, uh, com, um, uh, uh, style so here uh, we have the uh, red and uh, black uh, combination which also evolves the Swiss style of design you can uh, check the Swiss style of design and their color combinations that black red uh, has a, a predominant uh, emphasis on that and here also you see the uh, way the face of human face has been transformed which has a lot of connection with the art deco style which we were discussing uh, earlier and here we can see the uh, typographies are also has some similarities with the art deco but they are less ornamental and more geometric and um, the stigil movement we have to discuss uh, Piet Mondrian, Piet Mondrian so this uh, painting is called Broadway Boogie Boogie which is one of the famous painting and here also we can see a lot of uh, uh, the emphasis only the primary colors yellow blue and uh, red is um, uh, incorporated and here we have white in the Broadway Boogie Boogie in uh, some other composition we have white and black and the various tints of grey and some of the whites are a little greyish and so we have the neutral um, uh, uh, neutral color palette with uh, the primary colors. Even some of the postures, if we look at the uh, typography used in the stigil, the stigil is written and broken into pure geometry, pure rectilinear forms, and some of the um, uh, poster they also follows the similar color uh, palette and similar um, uh, uh, shapes and si uh, similar line quality. So after discussing all the uh, uh, varied advancement in, uh, in the technology of uh, digital media, uh, in the next uh, module onwards, we will discuss uh, uh, what are the different methodology. We will start discussing the methodology in uh, first, we will discuss the generic design methodology in visual uh, design domain. And then uh, as uh, it is a very uh, different um, uh, domains are there within the visual communication design, for example, animation, game 
and then we have a uh, web application and then we also have uh, the graphic design they are uh, very different the methodology of uh, designing in each and every domain is also uh, different so after discussing the general uh, design methodology we'll uh, discuss in each and every uh, different uh, seg uh, segments and uh, discuss their methodology and we also will uh, uh, talk about the um, eye tracking system and how uh, you can incorporate users feedback into your methodology part thank you